Hello, Global Gardeners. It's Monday. The weather's beginning to warm. The sun is out longer. This is the picture of my garden this morning. And it was actually before seven o'clock in the morning. The sun is coming up. I think that's so fantastic. I love this time of year. It's still too cold. It was only 19 degrees Fahrenheit when I got outside this morning. That is about, uh, looks like minus six Celsius. So it's cold but it's sunny and I'm so looking forward to gardening. As we get further along on our gardening journey, I think it's important that we each focus on not only developing our own skills and our own gardening knowledge, but I think when we help others learn gardening, it really makes what we know stronger, better, and really encourages us to learn more and help more. And so today I have a guest and we're going to discuss that topic. I want to go ahead and welcome Jan to the show. Jan, nice to see you. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. And so some of you may recognize Jan. He is a school teacher in Canada. And we've been working together to teach his kindergarten students about gardening. And it's primarily in a green stock vertical garden inside the classroom. But it's the main focus of the show today. For those of you who don't know, I ran a school garden about 10 years ago for middle schoolers, preteen kids. And so Today, we're going to talk about it. Jan, why don't you go ahead and share with us where your school is and what you're doing with your students? Yeah, well, believe it or not, I'm in Canada and there's no snow where I am. I'm in Montreal area, uh, so something's happening with the weather. Uh, so I'm teaching my kids how to garden this year, thanks to, to, to Scott's help, and it, they're kindergarten level. So that equivalents to maybe five, six years old in the States. I think it's similar the the school programs and it's it's been quite a nice experience i've never done a full garden before when i was in teaching i was teaching grade six a few years back we'd always start plants so start tomato plants but i'd never do the full process this is the first time where okay. i'm doing the full okay. process of gardening with my students and so it's important to point out and and i this is one of the things i'm impressed by you is you are a gardener who enjoys gardening and thought you would bring gardening into the classroom rather than just being a teacher who pulled some gardening subjects out of a book. So how long have you been gardening? <laughs> I've always wanted to garden in my heart. Um, I've, it's actually my second, this is, will actually be my second um, season gardening. Before I was doing landscaping, like as, as side jobs and, uh, but I've never started a full garden until last summer for, for, I just never had the time. So I took the time and I thought it was such a fun activity and I just wanted to continue. I figured, well, if I can get the proper help, I could take this the whole nine yards with my students. But I've always been hooked on gardening. I just never had the, the moment to do it. Okay, good, good. Yeah, I have really, you know, only been gardening for a little over 30 years, which is a long time for a lot of people. But of course, that's only about Just half of my years. lifetime. Years. <laughs> but it it's the it's the key, I think, and I've got a video on this. No doubt Jay will find the the video uh, where I think teaching gardening to kids really is a fantastic way to learn more about gardening. When I was teaching at the Galileo School Garden, I knew a lot about gardening. I was a master gardener at the time. I thought it would be a piece of cake to teach the kids how to garden. But what I found was that nine and 10 year olds ask completely different questions about gardening than you would expect. And you have to learn how to explain gardening at a much simpler level to make it understandable. How, what's your experience in that that realm, especially with your kids being younger? Yeah, well, the interest is there. They just, I mean, being adults, you see, like you've seen movies, you hear about your neighbor's garden, you've seen it happen. But for kids, elementary school kids, whether they're 10 years old or five years old, it's 
most of them is their first time. So the questions they're asking, they're real honest questions, but they're completely not how you would anticipate them because they don't know how it works. So they see a garden, they're like, okay, the like, when can I get the fruit? Um, well, we have to plant the seed first and we start with steps. So it's all about forgetting. It's trying to remember how when you started, and even that's like forgetting. So, okay, if I'm going to do a garden and I don't know anything, how do I start? So it's all about that. And also there's lots of, you've probably experienced at the Galileo, you answer the question, but you try and guide them back towards the right topic. Exactly. Um, yeah, trying to keep the focus can be difficult with kids. Now, Big Will Dog is saying, I had my little nephew and nieces come over in October for Uncle Willie's School of Nature. I love that idea. They pulled carrots and learned about composting and bring me their compost scraps now. That is a fantastic idea because though Jan and I have both taught at schools, I really do want all of you who are viewing to understand that this is the kind of thing you can do for your kids, your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews, the neighborhood kids, and get everybody involved with gardening. What kind of response are you seeing from your parents with uh, the enthusiasm that they're showing? I see, um, it's interesting because you'd mentioned getting the kids in the garden. I feel as if being a teacher with my students, it's a lot how a parent will want to teach their child gardening. Whereas for all the grandparents watching, you have a completely funner role because the way you're going to teach gardening, you have you, you take a different approach because you don't see them on a daily basis. So the response I get from my parents is mostly, I'm so glad you're doing this at school because I don't have the patience at home. But the grandparents, certain grandparents write to me and says, I started gardening with them. I'm going to start gardening this year as well. And they have a, and it's all a different approach because you don't see them as often. So your techniques and your strategies are going to be funner. It's always funner when you go see the grandparents. We all know that. That, that is fantastic. I'd, I'd actually kind of forgotten about that. Uh, they, the adults who were most enthusiastic at Galileo as well were the grandparents. And they, you're exactly right. I would give free seed packets to all the kids and they would usually take it to their grandparents house to put in the ground because the grandparents could help take care of the garden while the parents were at work so absolutely and right, idea. on your chat i just saw dennis blevins i think i'm sorry, I'm sorry I hope i'm pronouncing it properly say i will be doing that with my grandkids i haven't seen the parents say hmm i'm thinking about it yet maybe it passed but i didn't see it so i see parents are you saying sounds like a great idea <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I talk all the time about my granddaughters coming to the garden and all the activities that we are doing. Now, I want to go ahead and um, spend just a second here and change the background a little bit so that you all can see the, uh, I'm going to go full screen for this, Jan. So this is a picture of your kids in the classroom in front of the green stock. Tell yeah, the, the green stock is empty, but we had this us uh, starting our second season after after the holidays. So we we're just starting. Wonderful. And and here's an interesting idea from Shandy's Garden. I find that it's easier to get friends to come over and have a little bonfire and grill out at dusk if they know that the kids can play in the garden and harvest and learn. I love that idea too. Yeah. I mean, harvesting, everyone likes the harvest part. It, what comes before, that's, <laughs> it's after you plant the seeds, it's the what's in between the seeds and the harvesting. That's a little more frustrating. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Now, a shout out to Dennis Plevin, since you just highlighted Dennis. Dennis has gifted a Gardener Scout membership. So thank you for that, Dennis. And that's nice for everyone who is uh, wanting to become a member of the Gardener Scott channel. That's fantastic. I'll actually be doing a live stream for members only tomorrow at the training and collaborator level of the, the membership channel. So that's always a lot of fun. And so uh, as we talk about going from that step of planting the seed to the point that harvest reaches the, the end of the season, uh, tell us some of, you know, you and I have chatted a little bit about this, but tell us about what you're doing in the classroom 
what kind of lessons, what kind of guidance are you giving the kids to connect A to Z? Um, it, it's really, it's simple activities and quick. I mean, there's, kids learn a lot through play. And adults do too, except our version of play is much more structured. Like just gardening for you, uh, Gardener Scott, that's your form of play. Sure. But for a child, it's not the funnest type of play. So you have to try and get them hooked so they learn that that is a form of play, so they get hooked through it. Um, so it's all, it all starts with uh, showing them, saying, we're going to start a garden. And then be like, oh, what's a garden? Well, and then you have a show of hands, raising, and then you, you bring the students by shooting the questions and finding the ones that are towards your topic, saying, this is a garden, and we're going to do one in the classroom. And what was fun is when Greenstock, Greenstock was amazing. Uh, Gardner Scott uh, connected, us to, connected us to Greenstock, and we chatted with Greenstock a bit. And they sent us boxes. We basically unwrapped the entire Greenstock together with the students. And for them, even had that during free play, so the ones that were less interested would come see, but then the ones that were really interested would just like stay there and watch and unbox together. Um, for them, it was just like, okay, this is a present we're being gifted, and this is fun. And then I let them socks. And as you, for those who saw the first video, uh, you notice that the they had play, they were playing the green socks like Lego blocks, Lego blocks, and then they ended up finding the color pattern. They said, "Can we leave them like this?" And I was going. Sure. Uh, yes, Rob's allotment gardening. It's my dog trying to get green. Just read a <laughs> cut on the side. <laughs> um, so for back to the green socks, after they played with and they set up, then, well, okay, then what do we have to do? So it's all about questioning and going a step ahead. And suddenly, well, it becomes a routine to a point where, oh, plants are set up and what do we do now? Well, in the morning when you guys come in the classroom, the first thing you do is you water your plants. And as they're watering their plants, even though it's a boring, um, and as you're watering your plants, even though it's a kind of like a boring activity, it becomes routine. So they're not thinking about it. And then slowly they're seeing the seeds grow. And then they run to me and saying, something's happening with my soil. Or I think the plant is growing. And that's when that magic starts to ingrain itself on them because they're connecting with their plants every day. And then they see it grow. Whereas it almost becomes like bonding with an animal, except it's a plant. So it's less close, but they're bonding with their garden. And that gives them the idea of uh, wanting to keep on gardening because they want to see the result. And as they see uh, those, dis like they see their plant growing, then they're curious about what's going to happen next. So that's one of the activities, but I'll do a lot more during, in the classroom that's not related directly to the garden. And I'll feel free to chat about them later if you want. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I think and you may see this in the classroom. I like this idea, too, from Milltown Life. Ethan, nine-year-old grandson, has arranged to come stay a week with me to help build a stumpery, a rockery. I love that he knew it was something we could enjoy together. And I love that aspect of gardening that, especially with parents and their kids and grandparents and the grandkids. And tell us about what you're seeing in your classroom as far as that anticipation, that it is something to do as a group, as a, as a together activity, the gardening. Are you seeing that as well? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's fun because kids and everyone, like when you want to make a friend, like even as an adult, you want to do a common activity. For example, if I want to be friends with Governor Scott, I'm not going to talk about race cars because I don't see that as your interest. Maybe. But kids, kids are really smart and they want to connect with someone because they like them. And also they're prompted by their parents sometimes. And that's great. So then they're like, oh, this is something I could do with my granddad or my grandma or my dad or mom. And they'll suggest ideas. And sometimes you pick up on it or you don't. So I think it's a wonderful idea. I'm not sure if I, under, I answered correctly, though. No, that's the idea. It's just getting the kids. It, uh, I, I think it's easy, easier than we think to get the kids excited about doing something with an adult and especially with gardening and especially in today's world where all the kids seem to, especially young kids want to get their own phone so that they can spend all their time on the phone and starting early to get them excited about gardening and activity that they can actually do with other people. 
I think is just a fantastic way to approach teaching kids about life in general. I totally agree. And um, to, to, to build on that, because that comment was about, he wants to, I want, I'm going to build something with my child or my grandchild. And he suggested something we could do together. And that's the important part. You don't want to say, here's my garden, come garden with me. It's not going to be as fun if they're building on something you done, you did. It's much funner if you build together. So you go, and even for the, like for the greenhouse, or not the greenhouse, but the green stock, we started together. I brought soil that they put in the green stock. Like I showed them how to build a proper soil and earth. And same thing for uh, all those grandparents and out there. You want your kids to garden. It's fun if you start the project together. Like you can even start with the seeds, like go, Go to the grocery store and say, what would you like to grow? And it doesn't have to be that special purple tomato. They just, they've never grown. So they'll enjoy anything. I want a carrot. Perfect. We'll buy carrot seeds and we'll, we'll buy you your special seeding tray and you can have your special little garden to yourself. And that way the child is going to be much more connected to what's happening because it's Absolutely. their thing that you're going to be there. Yeah, I did a video about that, and I'm sure Jay will show us the link here momentarily on the purple garden. And I did exactly that with my granddaughters, asked what they wanted to grow. And then together we chose seeds intentionally to choose the carrot and, and the peas and the beans that they wanted to grow in the garden together. But we chose purple. So everything in that bed was uh, a purple carrot, a purple potato, a, a purple bean, and, and it was just absolutely a fantastic project. Now, Kippawa, and I, I definitely wanted to ask you about this as well. Uh, I'm trying to bring it. There it goes. Sugar snap peas seem to be really popular with kids, and my, my one granddaughter in particular runs straight to the garden to find the peas to eat. It's easy to grow, tasty treat. And it doesn't come from a can. And I've heard that at the Galileo Garden. And, and I mentioned that you, you were talking about some of the videos you watched where I was at the Galileo Garden. And I love telling the story about the, the girl who takes the carrot out of the ground and says, I didn't know carrots grew in the ground. That is so fantastic when they come to that realization. And so we're talking about sweet. We're talking about quick. We're talking about the surprise. What, what are you growing in your classroom for the kids to, to be able to harvest. Yeah, and that was thanks to your help also because, um, and I saw other other people also ask that question. It's, my classroom is very dark. So when I changed, when I started teaching kindergarten, our kindergarten, class, kindergarten classroom is not exposed to much light. So the challenge was lighting. So I had to go for quick growing and shade loving plants to try and maximize. And I have my grow lights too, because, um, that's the only way to grow things. So uh, I think with, with use, we narrowed down radishes definitely up there and like lettuce. And I think we had talked about um, uh, spinach and uh, carrot. I, I wanted carrots because it's, even though it's not the best shade loving plant, it is an iconic garden plant. Everyone likes a carrot, like presented somehow. And everyone's seen a Bugs Bunny video or a cartoon where there's a carrot being pulled out of the ground and it's just a funny like pulling a radish out of the ground doesn't have the same experience when you haven't seen cartoon character or pop culture do it so that's a good point we're definitely trying with that carrot and right now <laughs> but what what's been most successful right now is lettuce and um i i'm asking you to put it up scott because the, uh, it's a it's a it's a lot of work but um, there's one of the pictures I sent is the green is our green stock growing and what's popping up the most and the quickest is lettuce and radishes because they grow quickly and they, they're, they're not hard to maintain. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so shout out to Betty Barnes, a new member of the Gardner Scott community. Nice to have you as part of that, Betty. And then also another shout out to Ruth Ann, a member for a month now. Good morning to you as well, Ruth Ann. So uh, nice to have you all here. Uh, so here's an idea. We haven't talked about this. This is a, a really nice comment from um, Jaina. Kids love a worm bin. That's a gateway for explaining soil life. And, and my granddaughter who loves <laughs> bugs, 
when she comes to visit, she always asks to go downstairs to see my worm bin and to see all the worms crawling around. So uh, have you thought about this idea of adding a worm bin? I actually did, and I tried to get a grant for it, and it never passed. But at the same time, I think it turned out good because what happened is um, I was thinking much about a worm bin before the Christmas holidays. I'm going, oh, this garden is going great. It's a fun idea. And we could compost like for the whole school or for parts. But then when I came back from the holidays, my class was filled with fruit flies. Even oh. though we had unearthed everything in the garden, the snacks at school, the kids bring the bananas. It takes one banana peel to be stuck somewhere. And then, and I'm, I'm still fighting fruit flies. We're in starting oh. March and I had like fruit fly traps. And I mean, nothing more interesting than a protected classroom with no insects to eat them. Uh, and they're just, yeah, I can, we can see them in the end, but they're managed right now. So we, I definitely thought about the worm bin, but inside a school, I think it'd be outside, but I think it's a great idea for anyone wanting to garden at home with their kids or grandkids or outside, do a worm bin. Like if kids, you want them to connect the garden, if they catch a worm, you can bring it to the garden. So you can teach them that worms are good for, they're good for composting and they're good for soil life and airing out and kids just love it. Like I'm sure they'll just like, I've had a student bring me worms in a jar saying can we put this in the garden and i was going i think it's a great idea but in a green stock it might not be the best idea because there's no other place for them to go so i i, I wrote the parent i said thank you so much but we can't really put the worms in the classroom garden that's funny that's funny um brett lee is is asking have you considered making an art studio in the garden for them my niece loves art and could see them liking that and giving inspiration. I think that if the art studio works for your niece, keep going and if other people can, I have considered it, but I'm already doing a lot uh, with my curriculum. So to give you an idea, and so I just, even though I think about it, I don't have enough room in my activities. Um, just to give you an idea, kindergarten in Canada, I have five hours of my students. And we do like a good, a good chunk of that time, like a half an hour a day, we dedicate to gardening. And that's a lot of time considering all the other things I need to see with them. For example, uh, we do certain garden really activities. Like we'll take, uh, some, like right now, my next activity is we're gonna take, we're gonna cut a lettuce leaf and we're gonna paint it. And then we're gonna do imprinting on paper. Nice. Just to nice. get them to see that you can do things with art. And if we were potatoes, I do, I do the same thing with potatoes, but we're not. But uh, so I do a bit of art, but nothing too specific because um, I have all I have already my go-to activities. Like to get them to connect their garden twice a week. Once a week, we watch one of those um, um, time-lapse videos of a plant growing on YouTube. And also once a week, we play. Um, I play Where's Mala with <laughs> with with my students, and that's using your your dog, uh, Gardener Scott. So. I mean, first of all, my kids or students are francophone, so they don't really understand the videos. And first of all, your audience is not five or six year olds, but yeah. my students love Mala, even though they see them just rarely, and you've mentioned it. So to get them the idea of that gardeners are anyone and you can garden outside with pets, what I do is when I watch your videos, I just take the timestamps of Mala, your dog, and then I show my students, say, okay, now Gardener Scott is going to be planting his mushrooms or and garlic right now and see if you can spot mala and when they see mala they they stop they raise their hands and then i bring them back it's all about bringing them back to sure. awesome and like mala's around and what's happening with gardener scott right now even though uh gardeners you haven't done a direct live stream with my students yet they know you because you've made videos for them specifically and they're they've connected with you so nice. uh, I already do those activities and we take care of the garden and we have a little gardening book. So we, it's like cut out. So they, they have to find a picture of the seed and as it germinates, they have to cut the pic, they have to cut and glue the picture of the seed at where it's at right now until there's a full plant and they can color that. So to answer your question regarding the art studio, I do a bit of art inspired, but I don't have time to set up a whole thing. Sure. You know, and uh, that's one of the things, you know, I, I ran into that issue at Galileo as well, where the kids 
especially at a middle school where they're taking six classes a day and they only the classes are only 50 minutes long and they've got to go from class to class. So they would only have 30 minutes in the garden if they were brought out to the garden. And the teachers finding the time in the curriculum to devote to the garden was was the biggest problem I saw the, the, the five years I was at the, at the school garden. But taking them outside at your own house or at the grandparents' house really gives you more time to, to devote to the kids. And I think that is, in my opinion, a preferred method of teaching kids gardening is at home. I, I totally agree. And I think for parents and even the grandparents watch out there, I mean, the, the fun, I think the most, uh, the best life lessons you could do if you ever make the time for it is to see okay, what grade are they in right now. And for example, my grandchild's in grade six, I'm giving an idea or, and yeah, well, he's definitely doing multiplication and he's calculating. Well, how about you invite your grandchild, grandchild or your child and calculate a garden bed and build it together. The, the thing that's missing the most in schools and that the teachers try and which was great about the Galileo garden is that teachers are able to create material and to bring it to life. So you want to have a child like hooked on math or you want them to understand the real concepts. It's not on paper. It's in real life. You want them to make a good solid garden bed, get the materials and invite them over and do the calculations with them. Don't do it for them. Like have them help you and take the time. Like that garden bed will probably take you half an hour. And with your, with your grandkid, it take you two days because you're doing increments, but they're going to learn so much because they're going to connect what they're learning in school with real life. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree. And uh, it's not, not only did I have a challenge at Galileo getting the kids out in the garden, but I'm so glad as an educator that you have that mentality. I can remember standing in the garden with a math teacher and the math teacher said, I'd love to bring the kids out to the garden. This is such a beautiful space, but I just don't see how I could teach math in the garden. And I spent half an hour telling her about surface area in a bed and volume of a raised bed and counting the seeds and weighing the produce and comparing and contrasting the different variables from one bed or the next. <clears throat> and the next day she brought the kids out to the garden and she said that she'd been trying to teach volume for two weeks and the kids didn't get it. But in the garden, in that one class period, everybody, when they could see what volume means, filling a raised bed with soil, everybody figured out what volume was. So gardens are magical when it comes to education. Yeah, and I'm just going to hook on that. I think you've done so much for that Galileo School of Math and Science. I mean, the idea to start a garden is was a wonderful <laughs> idea. And I think you put so much time and effort. And I what what's what's boring or what sucks i think for, for you gardeners scott is that the payoff is so long term you might not see the results because you inspired teachers during the garden you showed them how to do volume and the teachers are always willing but in the tough time lapse sometimes teachers just resign and say i'll just do a textbook or they don't understand gardening's complicated that's why there's gardening is such a big thing on youtube because people want to start they just don't know how so I think that you do putting all that input, you did so much for that for that space in that school. I think you inspired hundreds of kids by just Thanks. planting that seed. And I'm sure one day they'll say, I remember I did gardening. You know what? I'm going to start because I, I remember doing it successfully or I did a farmer's market and it's such a, it was fun. I'd like to do that again or I'd like it to be a business. Uh, and I think that I hope that one day those kids can actually say, or just mention, do, do a shout out to Gardner Scott, because if it wasn't for you, I don't think that garden would have started because you put a lot of effort. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that. And and I, I didn't do it to get that shout out 20 years from now, but I completely agree with you that, that that's what it was. It was figuratively and literally planting a seed for each of those kids. They could plant the seed, take care of the plant and harvest it, but in their mind, when they start having a family of their own and they actually have a plot to start growing, I I agree. I'm hoping that they will say, 
wow, I've got this spare space. And all those years ago, I learned how to grow. I'm going to take advantage of that and start growing my own stuff. Totally. And I mean, for all the parents and grandparents out there, if you do one activity this summer with your grandkid or kid, that's great. And if they want to do more, perfect. But the idea, it's it's kind of a plan. It's a long-term inve investment. If you want to transfer that, it's probably when they'll be adults and have their own patch of land that they'll say, oh, I'm going to go see my my dad or my mom or my grandmother. And can you, can we start a garden again? Or can you help me get started? Sometimes it might, might not want to garden for 10 years because they can't, but the seed is planted and there definitely there's interest there. Fun. Alora is saying, I really think that the best curriculum is thematic unit. When you integrate all the subjects into a theme, you really teach the why behind the subject. And I'm all about teaching the why it, it gives learning a point. And so, you know, I, I definitely took that approach, a lot of why when I was teaching my kids in the garden, but they were older. Do, do you find it more of a challenge with the younger kids you have where you can, you can show them the what and you can practice it, but how do you convey the why you garden and the why a seed grows and why the plant gets better. Do you delve into that? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think I'll give an example. I'm, I'm teaching my, 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 she's going to be three years old in a month, my, my child to garden. And last year, my, she, she's my partner, my wife. Um, every summer, she, every day of the summer, she would go outside and play with my, my child and, or our, our child. And, she would just like water the plants and we bought him his own little watering can. And he, every day, the routine just started watering. He wouldn't ask himself a question because he just thought it was a fun game to ask water because he likes water. So to answer your question, I don't really delve with my five and six year olds. I don't really delve into the why we garden. I just delve into the gardening is fun, period. Okay. It's fun to grow something. And I mean, when I was teaching uh, grade six students and in 12, well, well 10, 11, um, well, they understand more how the world works and they're starting to. And that's when you can go into like the mission of like gardeners. And I think everyone right now watching gardening and following and who likes gardening have a much bigger role than we think we do. And I, the students can understand that when they're, and the children can understand that when they start understanding of how the concept of like the real concept, like for me is when you can start to do sarcastic jokes. <laughs> like <laughs> okay. that's my, that's my benchmark is becoming adults and you can understand like projection and topics that are complicated because like, you don't just garden because you want to like, because you want to garden, like you, you garden because it's some people do it to save money. Some people do it because you you like to grow things but it's also the challenge it's also the experience and uh, like gardening is also and this is for people who do um correct me if like heritage garden is that the term in english or like you're planting the same seed over and over again every uh, year but yeah yeah heirloom is the heirloom. the term that most is most often is used in the u.s i think heritage is a uk term so that might be why why you're more familiar with that in Canada. But there's a sense of like pride and culture also in that because I mean, if you're planting the same tomatoes that your ancestors were planting, because you won't find them at the grocery store, but if you're planting the same tomatoes or the same vegetables that your aunt planted when they were colonizing, uh, colonizing the U.S. or in Europe, like back away, or it, like there's an attachment to it, sure. and if it wasn't for gardeners, like that whole part of history and uh, are, would be gone because capitalism, gardeners do not want, uh, not gardeners, but grocers don't want like purple tomatoes. They want like big juicy tomatoes and that's it. Yeah, but all those definitely. unique seeds are preserved because of us gardeners. And I think that students feel pride in that and kids and adults do as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And it's that connection. <coughs> uh, Tony O'Neill from Simplify Gardening has joined the chat. And uh, congratulations, Tony, on having a number one gardening bestseller over the course of the last week when the, the book went live. But Tony's focus for writing his third book 
comes down to what he remembers with his grandfather and his grandfather working with him in the garden. And I don't think I've, I've ever asked this question of Tony, but you can definitely give us an answer if you would, Tony. But I try to grow plants that I remember my aunt in particular. She's the only one in my extended family that had a garden. And so the question to you, Tony, is are you growing plants in your garden because your grandfather grew them? Like, like Jan is saying, have you, are you choosing to grow specific varieties that are now a couple generations down the road? Because I, I love that idea, Jen. And I actually haven't really thought much about that as far as my granddaughters are concerned, where I grow plants, I save seeds, I grow the same plant again, but I'm not necessarily growing those plants to pass on to my grandkids so that they can then grow the same plant. I, lo I love that idea. Imagine if you did. Imagine if you gave, like, for example, imagine if you gave your grandkids when they're old enough or even your daughter saying, this garlic, I've been growing this garlic forever. Like, I haven't bought any garlic. This is the same purple striped garlic I've been growing in my garden forever. Like, it's always from the same, for same plant and I'm giving it to you. I mean, she might just say I'm not interested, but... If you give it to someone who's of interest, that's like you're preserving history already. And then yeah. they have that option of doing that with their kids later. Like it's amazing. If if there's interest, I think it's a wonderful idea. And 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 I'd forgotten that. I'm glad you said that about strawberries. I've mentioned that in some of my videos that the strawberry plants I grow now are the same plants. I just pot up the the daughters, the runners, and plant more of them. But the same strawberries that I was growing almost 25 years ago now with their parent, my daughter. And so, yeah, when they, I remembered saying that when they were first eating the strawberries in my garden, I played that little game and, and it's like, guess who else ate that strawberry? And of course my daughter was standing right there and it, it's, it's the same strawberry two decades later. So absolutely. Yeah. So Tony, we're still waiting for that answer. Oh, I, I, he, he, I, I popped it up on the screen. He says he oh, has. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't pay attention. He has one of his grandfather's pear trees in the garden that he dug up when his grandfather died. So. Oh, um, that's that's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely wonderful way to do it. Uh, hello to Woodline Gar Woodline Worker. I saw your comment earlier that you just discovered the channel this week. Thank you for that donation. I appreciate it. Here's a small donation for showing me how to get my seedlings started this year. Greetings from the Peach State. And so I, I have to assume it's Georgia, Georgia peaches. So correct me if there's another state out there that calls themselves the Peach State. But that's fantastic. Thank you for being here. And I'm so glad you found us and to join us on the live stream. For those of you that might just be joining, uh, Jan, my guest today is a teacher in Canada and teaches all the typical subjects you might teach in kindergarten, but has integrated gardening using the green stock towers that you see behind me in his classroom. And so the next question, I look at it as a classroom, you look at it as a classroom, but because of the excitement and because you're doing it every day, how many of your students are thinking of that room as a garden. They're coming to school to visit the garden rather than sitting in the classroom. Well, it's definitely, I think they see it as a classroom, but for them, like they're five and six years old. So their concept of a classroom is so plastic right now. It's like Play-Doh. So for them, like they, even though they see me leave every day for those who stay after school, they still think I sleep at school. <laughs> so, like, But it's funny because they think I sleep at school, but now because we're in we're in kind of starting march but they know more they know so much about gardening and they're young they might they'll forget a lot about of it but um so they see the classroom as like this entire project thing i remember i, I saw a few people mention in the comments that project learning and like project based education or activities is the best way and when they arrive in my classroom for them they're going to play all day and do projects we're going to even if we're practicing play writing or play reading for them. It's the whole idea is you make it fun and you turn it into kind of a game. 
So for gardening, it's part of their game, and okay. sometimes or walk around and like turn the green stock, like you would like shuffle through a library. Just look at the plants. Regardless, it's not all of my students. Like I have two who really, really love the garden. The others like activity, but they're ready to move on when they've they've done their part. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so here's and a question, a uh, little bit different, and uh, I don't know if you have experience with this. Amy's asking, do you like patty pan squash better than crook neck or straight neck yellow? So I actually like straight neck yellow because of how I fix it. I like to grill my squash on the, the, the grill, and I, I love it that way, or I'll cube it. And I find it easier to do that with a straight neck yellow squash than the patty pan, the, the squat squash. But uh, have, have, you, have you grown, not in the classroom, but just in your own garden, uh, any particular type of squash that is a favorite of yours? Oh, my gosh. Like, if um, you missed a part, this is my second season gardening. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm okay. learning. I think if I count my success rate, because you made a video about, it's you count your successes. and. I've had a high success rate because I'm able to grow things. Uh, so I don't, I've grown squash, I've, but I've grown, I stuck to just like I had, I bought butternut squash seeds and that was it. So the, even the squash varies you mentioned, I'm sorry, I don't really know them. <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. I just thought I'd throw it out there. I love butternut squash. I love to make butternut squash soup from my own butternut squash so fantastic in early winter when it's cold out you can still literally taste your garden so yeah. that's one of the things i, I think I from really my personal like. garden where i've experienced like extending a bit and trying stuff out is garlic okay but that's nice. it like i rest i've stuck to straight simple this year i'm trying new things but i don't know i haven't they they're my ceilings aren't started yet and so this is an interesting um, point. And I remember thinking this when you and I first connected and I'd forgotten it. So I, I'm glad that Milltown Life is bringing this up. Kindergarten is the etymology in German for children garden. And so I I definitely, you know, when, when I first, because it's been over a year that you and I first connected. And that was one of my first thoughts was a children's garden actually in a kindergarten so thank you for reminding me about that yeah, it, it's life. kind of uh, the ir not the irony but like the the word play on what's actually we're literally doing gardening in a classroom so it's funny <laughs> yeah yeah no i think it's it's wonderful and, and it's um and of course you don't have to just garden in kindergarten you can garden throughout the the year the, the biggest issue at least here in the states and you're encountering this as well you've you've applied for grants you're trying to get funding for these ideas, then you want to expand the garden. And that's just one of the sad truths of education is getting those projects and programs in place takes money and it is difficult. Yeah, and it takes a lot of time. So in <laughs> Canada, I mean, we have a really big, uh, there's a big agricultural system and the, actually, I'm discovering that there's more grants than I thought existed and I'm actually reaching out, but there is some really good grants happening right now in, in, in Canada. Well, I can speak for Quebec because their provinces are like the States. So they're regionally, there's, there's regions and they're they have their own thing also. So and there's some like large scale grants, but there's a lot more grants and there's a few that I'm actually applying for right now, but it also goes with, in my in my school, I'm the only one gardening. There's some teachers who are just it's it's a lot of time management, and they see the effort we put in, and it's also I don't have the time to prioritize other things. So that's that's the other issue. Um, when you were at the Galileo Gardens, what was cool was that the garden was outside, and uh, the prep work you did all the prep work with your volunteers. So, for example, I, you mentioned that the scouts came over and all that. It wasn't the teacher doing it. Whereas in my classroom, I'm doing all the prep work. And it's not that the it's not that the the teachers don't want to. Is that like we're we're not a, teachers aren't paid overtime, so they, they can't. It's like they have families and it's so they just do what they do the best they can with the time they have. So that's the other issue. 
you can get all the yeah. grants, but you to start that stuff. Absolutely. I, I helped start six or eight school gardens in the area during my five years of Galileo. And I, I, I'm, I think only one of them is still a actually active all these years later. And that's the problem. It's usually one teacher that does all the work. And the one program that has been most successful, they invited me to, to advise the, uh, because they wanted to start a school garden. And I sat down with the principal. I sat down with the, the president of their PTA. And I told him that I could help them start a garden. They could do it. But for it to be sustainable, they needed to have a network of volunteers, a network of other teachers. And after that principal left, the new principal of the school that came in already saw the foundation in place and it was easy to keep the program going. So uh, it it's definitely important that it's not just one person because sadly at your school, when you move to another grade or an, another school, your kindergarten project is probably going to, to stop at, the, at that school that you're at. But you could start again with a new school. Definitely. I'm seeing some comments and it goes a bit with that too regarding gardening in the classroom. There's nothing that's specifically made. There's books that exist, but uh, I'm going to address a few questions uh, 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 may, mentioned by people. And by the way, hello, François Bou I see you from Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu. That's nearby. Uh, okay. But gardening, like the green Bonjour. stock. There's, oh, you're speaking Québécois, French. Oui, but, uh, oui. Je parle français en peau. There you we go. <laughs> and and so for those of you that don't know, Jan had actually referenced some videos that I made for the kids. And I, I had French in college, so I speak a little bit of French. And so for for some of what I've I've given you to use in your classroom, I do speak a little bit of French to the students. And uh, it's, it's good. The students understand. Like it's it's French with an English accent, and it's wonderful. Yeah. So anyway, I'm sorry. You get back to what you were saying about the no words. This is fun. Um, so for the green stock, the green stock was actually when I was talking with you at the beginning, I didn't know. I wasn't sure exactly, but I knew a vertical garden was the best for time space. And the biggest challenge was getting the green stock to work in a classroom because um, surprisingly, when we were chatting, green stock was saying, perfect, we'd love to send you this product. And then I realized as we were chatting that, oh, the drainage of the green stock. It doesn't just like contain the water because it's not made for that. And uh, so I had to basically, and there goes the time thing. I had to create the environment for the green stock to work. I still think that it was the best thing for my situation because it's hard plastic. Uh, it, it's easy. It turns, but I had to raise it on a wooden platform and add drainage bins under. So when okay. we water, the excess water goes in the big bins. And that was the, the biggest challenge at the beginning was setting up my lights uh, with to work properly with the green stock. And still, I'm going to make some changes for next year, my students, and setting up the lights and having it drain. So at first, I'd have them both drain in a small pan, but then it would always overflow. So I ended up raising it on the bigger platform, which not every teacher can have access to the tools and materials raising on the bigger platform and having them both drain in the bigger in the bigger bin so when the bins are full well i just take that water I either put it back in the green stock or i feed my other classroom plants with it because yeah, my students great. actually see my classroom as a garden because i've all had plants in my garden i've been i've been doing i've been working with plants since i super young so i've always liked this, but i've never grown uh vegetables or flowers yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, when we chatted all those months ago, uh, I know lights was, I think, my my biggest concern for you. And you know, I've, I've seen teachers that will take a plant in the classroom to teach gardening or to teach about plants, and they just stick it on their desk and it ends up dying because they really don't know how to take care of it. And so for anyone growing indoors, particularly a classroom, the lights really do become a factor. So why don't you explain, because the green stock is tall and narrow, how did you end up solving that lighting issue? Well, I think it's going to be solved next garden season because what's happening is 
Um, okay, I'll take this coffee cup. I'll teacher moment here. So I have my green stock, <laughs> two coffee cups. Look at that. So I have my green, I have my green stock set up right now. Uh, okay, here we go. And at first I had them really close together, and then I had just the lights nearby. But then, well, if the lights weren't well positioning, so the green stocks would grow different. So now I spaced space them out and I turned the entire green stock box that I got the green stocks in into a reflective panel. That was a fun like arts and crafts activity with my students. So I had aluminum foil. So we set up a whole backing in back and then I spread my lights at the top. And still what I'm getting is the whole green stock is growing, but the top is growing much faster because the light is closer. So Right now, it goes with time. I don't have the time to uh, stop and set the lights vertical like this behind or on the side, which is what I wanted to do. But at the same time, I'm learning the go because it hasn't been specifically done before, and I don't want the students to burn themselves on the light. I have, I want, I make sure that the lights have to be set up so it's not a fire hazard, and I don't want S high enough so that adults can go see the garden without bonking their head. <laughs> so there's this whole thing that you're learning as you go and the first setup well i it'd be in the way the garden was in the middle of the classroom it was neat but then the plants would get hooked all the time by the students passing so they'd break so we didn't get and then anyways uh things happened with her with her education system that did that we weren't able to finish that garden or bring the, the plants to uh to full term so right now is this year where the radishes, they're getting big and red at the right. top. So then what I tried, I said, well, I'll see if I can rotate the garden during the student's playtime with the students. Don't do that. <laughs> when you have full lettuce growing in your green stock, you can't take the top off and then put it at the bottom because you're going to crush part of the lettuce. So it's things that I'm learning that, okay, well, it worked, but I've affected my plants, but now it's going to be more growing even. So it's a lot of trial and error to set up with the lights. And I think that next year I'm going to try and set them up differently. Um, but it, once again, it goes to building skills. You have to be able to build something. There's nothing specific that exists for gardening in a classroom. Absolutely. <clears throat> That's a good example, I think, of gardening in general, that nobody has the, the right answer or the best answer even when you begin. It's an evolution over time of learning what's going to work this year, and then you modify it for next year, and hopefully you improve along the way. So uh, when you when you finally have it exactly the way that it works perfectly, you can write a paper and publish it. And yeah, it and I mean, will appreciate it. I agree, and I think I think if uh, if green stock ever seems to reinvent itself, I, they're the closest thing possible to, um, and I'm not, it's not publicity, but it's just like, and it's free to anyone, but Greenstock has the closest product for uh, a whole classroom kit setting. It just needs a, a few tweaks. But if anyone in there wants to start a business, all we need as teachers is an easy draining vertical garden that doesn't drain on the floor. So a way to, to keep that water that's like easy to assemble and a lighting system that's safe and that works. So that's the only thing missing because the whole idea of gardening and vertically in a strong solid plastic pot it, that turns is the way to go yeah, because absolutely. i can turn them once they're growing i can turn them and the reflective panel so it's it's hard to see something that's and it has to be on a big scale absolutely uh boothby gardens is saying that you can get green stocks in canada now <clears throat> and they've been shipping there for a while but the shipping is not bonkers it used to cost a fortune to to send into canada so they're they're starting to figure it out uh, a little bit better. I do have a link to Greenstock below uh, because they're just such a wonderful company. And I hope to have more information in the future, but you will start seeing Greenstocks appearing in Europe, which I think is really exciting. Not the UK quite yet, but they're making inroads into Europe. So as Greenstock becomes more available, let's hope that there is some inventor out there, some garden gardener inventor that will be able to take us to that next level um, and then just oh go ahead sorry uh just a quick question someone said would a wicking basket work with gardening it would work but it depends on your layout many classrooms are in a big 
brick building, so the lighting is not always best. If your classroom is one of those large space, uh, big windowed classroom, you could probably get off at a certain point with, um, you could probably get off at a certain point by just having it near the window with a bit of light or you start it in spring. So you get one gardening season in with your students and you have a large space, but I don't have that in my classroom. My classroom is this, actually the school used to be office buildings and then it got renovated. So the classrooms are tiny. So we make it what we can. Okay. Uh, Moondust is wondering, is there a way to install a sprinkler or irrigation system inside of a greenhouse? Now we're talking about green stock. So if, uh, if you meant to say, uh, green stock. I actually have a video where I show the irrigation system for the green stock. If you meant a greenhouse, absolutely. You can just run the hoses and lines and emitters and sprinklers. And that's what professional greenhouses do all the time. So uh, absolutely, you can set up an irrigation sprinkler system inside a greenhouse. But for the green stock, they actually have their own uh, irrigation system that clicks on the side of the green stock to water it. And, but you like the kids actually doing the watering, right? That's part of your activities that you take in, in the classroom, right, Jen? Oh, yeah. And I mean, the kids are learning how to water. So they're learning, they're learning how to dose and what they're learning how to, um, how, what quantities to give their plants. So I'm showing them with, we've turned uh, old paint bottles into like, push waterers because it's easier to manipulate and it's free <laughs> so rather than buying watering pills for everyone uh so they're learning certain kids will just like squeeze the entire bottle where i'm like no you just squeeze a little bit and you test the soil and then i mean the top watering is nice because i can just like add some water at the top and i know that the roots that go to the middle of the green stock now will get some water but I really want students to feel the entire experience of watering. So there's no thematic thing. This is everything you do, you're doing on yourself. And I'll help you if you have questions, but the students are learning, like they're going to be picking those vegetables. They're going to be, if the leaf is dying, the ones taking the classroom scissors or pulling out that, that, that dying leaf because it's not useful. So I go see them. I say, let's go look at your garden together. Okay. This right now, this plant isn't growing well. And um, as we saw from Gardner Scott's videos with Mala, and sometimes you just have to pull away the plant and kill it. Feel bad. It's okay. It's not all, it's alive, but it doesn't have feelings. And you're allowing that other radish beside to grow bigger. So they pull it out and sometimes they're, they don't cry, but they're like, I killed the plant. And they're like, no, you didn't. It's fine. That's how life works. And when they'll be pulling them out and eating, Guess what will be happening? They will be dead, but it's okay. Plants are food. Don't have things or emotions. They just make us feel better when we take care of them. So it's, it's all about that situation. They're doing everything hands-on, the most possible. Absolutely. That, that's wonderful. Now, have you uh, experienced one of the things I used to, to love at Galileo? And, and often, like we said earlier, it was the grandparents that would comment to me, but the kids that that I worked with would take their seeds or they'd go to their their garden that they were setting up with their parents or grandparents. And they would actually the kids would actually teach the adults about what they'd learned as they were trying things in the garden. So even with your five and six year old kindergartners, uh, are you getting any feedback on that where the kids are sharing the stories and effectively teaching the adults? I have, because uh, we, we have to, because we have, well, we meet the parents and we talk to them on a regular basis to keep that connection. Some parents actually give us updates. To give you an example, before the holidays, <coughs> because the gardening season had to be put to turn, well, I thought about it. I even consulted you on that. I said, well, it would be neat if they try. So uh, with the students, we uprooted their strongest plant or their strongest planter in the green stock, and we transplanted it inside a little milk carton and they brought it home certain plants just disappeared but many not many but maybe a few parents said we don't have that plant you sent home and uh we can't even touch it because our little our little daughter wants to be the one watering and if we're doing it she's we're, she's saying we're doing it wrong so it, it gives i guess some of them just like the control over it but 
So they say it's more light. So it, it's certain. It's fun that certain parents uh, saw the, saw the interest in their child and they said, "Okay, you know what? You want to take care of it? We'll help you." And but at the same time, certain parents bought like a little small light bulb. But that's that's sometimes it's just not feasible. I mean, I know that Gal yeah. the Gal O'Neill yeah. School where you worked at. I don't think it was um, a money. It, I don't think it was a school where all the students had like like well parents that were well off i think some had oh, yeah. some tough times yeah most most of our students the large large majority of our students were uh were not able to buy their own products they were on the the free and reduced lunch schedule and many of them couldn't even eat lunch if they weren't uh a part of of that system so the idea of buying lights and buying all the gardening stuff for home really was a non-starter. And so uh, it, it really couldn't be anything more than a milk carton uh, on a counter by a window. But that, often that's enough just to, to keep their interest yeah. going. Definitely. And how did your, um, how did it, you must have gotten much more feedback from your community because of that situation. Because you're teaching the students how to be, in a way, self-sufficient. And also they're learning that, Sometimes you don't need to buy the food. You can grow it yourself. How was that experience for you? Oh, yeah, absolutely fantastic. We, the last couple of years, we would grow more than 2,000 pounds of produce that was actually served in the, the school. And, <laughs> and yeah, and that was, and so <clears throat> I was real good at networking. And so there, uh, the one of the local universities has a program, a nutrition program, and I worked with them. And so they had some of their students come to our school and actually gave cooking demonstrations at our school with what the students grew. So the students grew it, harvested it, and then washed it, and then saw how it was made into something that they could eat, not just raw, but actually cooked. And, and for some you know, safety considerations didn't allow the kids to do much cooking. Uh, but we we had a lot of programs like that where it was immediate feedback from the community wanting to help out and and do more with what we were growing in the garden. And then the kids seeing that as well. So, oh, yeah, I could go on for days with all the stories of what we were able to do. It's interesting because it makes me think of, um, hear about, sorry, there's a car passing. It's interesting because you hear about these people who decide to just, um, buy a house in the middle of nowhere. Like they, they start homesteading and it feels as if like you're setting up, you're planting that seed if they want to do a homestead. Like they know, they, they have the interest in garden. They know, they learn, they learned at the Galileo school that they can cook by some activities. It's a good motivation for people who don't grow up with much money and say, you know, I could have a home and I could homestead and I could be not self-sufficient, but I could like save money that way and I could live a far away. Like it's the idea for certain people like saying I could make a life and be happy doing this. And absolutely. Totally an idea. And there, there are a lot of other aspects. And so when we talk gardening, we often talk about growing the plant and getting the harvest. We talked earlier about some of the educational lessons that you could do in a garden, but there's a lot more about gardening. One of the kids, I don't think I've, I've shared this story before. We, when we were actually building the beds in the, in the very beginning, because we started with nothing, and I was told that I couldn't let the kids touch any of the power tools for safety considerations, but as, as soon as the the power tool police left the garden. I showed kids how to use cordless drills. And so one kid in particular was was drilling the screws to put uh, one raised bed together. And he, he just was emotional about building this raised bed. We hadn't even started talking yet about filling it with soil and growing the plants. And, and we talked uh, at the end of the class and he looked at me, came up to me and said, I get it now. And it, it's like, what? And he said, this is what my father does every day. This is his job. He he builds things. He works with tools. And now, now I get it. 
And, you know, this is a preteen who probably, like a lot of preteens, had a strained relationship with his parents. And in that moment, I could tell he had a new respect for his father and why his father was always gone and had to go to work early and all the rest of it because he built a garden bed using the same tools and methods that he now knew his father did. So there are so many lessons in a garden that go beyond the plants and the food that we don't even realize mm -hmm. until we get somebody out in the garden to teach. It's crazy. That's the whole point of like bringing something hands on. Like you can understand, that's a great, you can understand from on book what an architect does or what a construction worker does or what a woodworker does or a gardener does. But if you don't do something that's connected to it, it's hard for it to really ingrain itself. I think that's just a wonderful story. Thanks. Thanks. And, and Carla says it teaches children that they can be successful and change their circumstances. Absolutely. That they can grow and accomplish whatever they want in life. And I completely agree with that. If you can manage a garden and learn from it, then you can manage your life and learn along the way as well. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's just a very interesting topic. Uh, SJK says, input from a retired teacher. These are wonderful ideas, but kindergarten is totally different than higher grades where teachers feel hemmed in by required curriculum and uncreative, unsupportive administration. Uh, yeah, I definitely had to overcome the lack of support from all levels. Uh, you know, at Galileo, we built that amazing garden that you can see in my videos of six and seven years ago with, with no financing from the school district. School district never gave us a budget to build that garden. Everything was fundraising. Everything was grants. Everything was volunteers. And, and so you're, we talked a little bit about that. You are trying to find those funding sources, but uh, are you getting the support? And I don't want to put you too much on the spot politically, uh, but are you getting the support from your administration and other teachers as you move forward? When it comes to that, it's um, administration. They have a fine line because I, first of all, I wouldn't want an administrator's job because they, what they do is very tough. They're basically master of none. Like they have to help the teachers, but they also have to, they have to follow the school boards. So they're stuck between like, they, they have a laws that they have to follow because their job is at risk. Like teachers are, are unionized. So what it makes is that administrators, it, administrators, my administrators are very, very open-minded, but they have to focus it on, is it safe for the students? They have a budget to follow. So, so basically what they do is they need proof. A lot of them, sometimes they'll say, well, can you find a budget for that? Can you, can that, and they'll try and see if it fits in their existing school budgets. But if it doesn't, they're saying, well, we're, you can do the project, go for it, but we don't have a funding option by the school board. You'll have to try and find, find your funding elsewhere because at the same time, because it's not their job to find funding for me if I'm doing a project that's out of the curriculum idea, like the, out of the yeah. basics. So they've been very supportive. Like they've come to my staff. They think it's really cool. And I don't, And but they haven't been able to I think the best thing that they did was to say, go do your garden and be open-minded to my ideas because that's like, see it as you're working, see it as like someone, it's a completely like out of the ballpark question. Like not many teachers are going to say, I want to start a garden. Okay. Outside? No, in my classroom. Like it's a, it's a quite wild idea when you think about the traditional role of teaching. So they've been super supportive that supportive in that. And I, that's great. And now it's just a question of finding funding. And I did. Uh, and I find funding for help. And yes, I paid for a bit. But at the same time, there's lots of um, lots of companies who give grants. And they're, they're saying, well, send us results that you're starting and we'll help you out. So yes. there's been that part. At the same time, it also goes with every teacher wants the best for their students. And every teacher is, gonna, is equipped with certain capacities to try and make it work. I think is super important for particularly these days for uh, children to know or to connect a little bit with gardening. I think it, it pays off in a long time.
And I'm basically set up to do it again next year for free. Like I have all the equipment. Right. It's kind of like your garden's done. The initial investment is done and you're set up. And I'm, 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 I'm able to absorb part of the, part of the cost because I know that uh, certain companies are just waiting to see, like, show us a video of them plucking those radish out and then we'll give you money. Okay. And, and, and it grows get, definitely get those videos done because you, you want to take advantage of that. Uh, Mima Flowers is saying in my city, the schools must all have a garden. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I, I think that's very forward thinking. And like you said, it, it's long term. It pays dividends here in Colorado. I'm not sure if they're still doing it. They were doing it when I was at Galileo, but they actually the school district in Denver, a very big city, said, if you want a school garden, we will pay for it. And they were so supportive of the concept of school gardens, but it still comes down to the teacher. It still comes down to somebody who has to take on that role to set up the school garden. And that's one reason why I do what I do is to grow more gardeners, some of them teachers, to actually take it forth into the classroom. And, and It's a long-term thing. It just takes one person from the effort you've put in into like this chat we're having the video you made it just takes one person to say i want to try that and then after that which that might multiply into a couple other people it's a long-term thing but the, the seed is you're planting the seed yourself online of teachers can do it here's a person who's trying to do it and when i'm experienced enough in guarding a classroom i'm going to start giving conferences to my the local teacher conferences to say you can do it this is the setup but it takes time to build. That. And I think it's a wonderful thing that that city that says the schools need to have garden gardens. That's great. Like Montreal, where my city is, they have grants. They have amazing grants for uh, other things. And there's and there's also other grants like I'm learning right now for gardening. But setting up with a school, it's it's a thing. But it depends. It always depends who's in charge. That that those people in the city who said, let's do this. I, the garden thrilled about what's happening because that's just amazing. Fantastic. Big Will Dog says, my teacher friend had to work with the school board to get students grown vegetables into the school lunch menu. It actually saved the school money and students were involved. And there's, there's a big education. You're not dealing with this yet, Jan. You never know. You might someday. But we had to follow USDA GAP practices, good agricultural practices. And we had to actually, uh, the teacher I worked with primarily, we had to go to the school board and say, we are following the USDA guidelines for cleanliness in the garden, for harvesting. The students had to wear gloves, you know, disposable plastic gloves if they were going to harvest something that was going to be used in the kitchen. And sometimes you have to, you know, learn extra and then take a few extra practices. But for anyone who wants to do it, there's usually a way to get away with it. Oh, yeah. And I think that's why it all comes back to for all the grandparents and parents there at home. It's so much easier. It's so much simpler. There's no red tape. There's no nothing. I, I think that's the best thing you can do. Teach them yourselves. But at school. Absolutely. It's, it's all about, because schools are, you're basically, it's all about the mindset. It's not that schools are boring. It's that schools are centers where parents are trusting them to take care of their kids. So it takes that one, it, it takes that one uh, salmonella outbreak. It's, there's not going to be salmonella outbreak anywhere, like in a school garden, but I'm giving an example. It takes that yeah. one kid who gets sick from a zucchini that was grown. And the whole project is like, well, we're putting our kids at risk. It's, it's just illegally, I wouldn't tolerate my students, to, my child, to be at risk in this environment. And that's what the red tape is for. It's yeah. it's yeah. long and it takes energy. It's for a reason. Yeah, it really is. Um, <clears throat> Moondust is asking, how much soil or compost does a green stock hold? Where can I get one? Please and thank you. So I've got a link below to green stock. You can go there. And there's a couple different sizes of green stock and they hold different amounts of soil. But uh, I actually have a video. The video I have that I made with Jan with the kids shows them filling the green stock. And I've got other videos that show how to fill a green stock and how much soil is involved. So 
uh, Moon Dust. For more info, you can check out my videos and and also click that link to take you to Greenstock to see the different sizes they have because that will influence it. Um, I forget. Um, do you have the 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 deep pocket original green stock or the the leaf shorter pocket green I have, stock? I have the leaf. Brain. I have the leaf shorter one. So I think they need to be wider and less deep. Yeah. So if you look over my shoulder here, you'll see the classroom. Uh, this is Jan's kindergarten classroom with their green stocks set up, and uh, you can see that those are the smaller size, and it depends on the the bag of potting soil that, that you get, but, um, and it depends on how many levels you have. So there's a lot of factors. How many, how many bags of potting mix did it take you to fill up both of those? Um, I think the end calculation was one tray. I think it holds, I might be wrong. It's been a, it's been a while since I, I looked up the calculation. I think it was 15 liters of soil. Um, so basically what I did is I went to I went to a, a garden center and I told them my project and I said, hey, would you like to help? And they, they gave me a good price on this up. So I ended up having like just one big giant bag of peat moss, one like, and I, I, calc I over calculated just to be sure. And I ended up having, I have like maybe 45 liters left of uh, compost uh, garden soil and, um, It'll come back to me what the other one is, but I had like I we mixed three we mixed three uh three types of soil together, well we mixed three types of medium together to make a proper gardening soil. Good, good. Um, Shandy's garden says both of the green stock sizes can be interchangeable. They have the same width, and that's true. It's just the depth that's different. I like for someone new to the green stock. I like recommending the they call it the inventors bundle which is actually three of the deep ones and three of the, the leaf shallow ones. And you can set them up uh, in, in your tower. So uh, it, it all comes down to the different sizes that you want. And, and so uh, as you move forward, based on the lessons you learned last year and what you're already beginning to learn at the beginning of this semester, what would you do differently you know, because we're always looking for different ways to improve our garden. So is there something that you've discovered that you thought would work in the beginning, but you need to do differently, either with the green stock or with teaching the kids? Um, I think with teaching a kid, it's it's more differently, but because I've had the time to uh, to develop more material. So when we started off, we started just well, how we started was pretty neat. So we communicated with you and then like we talked about the green stock. And um, I really, I think I really like starting the green stock from scratch. So all the soil that's in that green stock, well, I'll dump it out and we'll start making that soil again because that was a really fun activity for them to understand that like compost has a different, has a different role and uh, sand and silt and all that, all that rock has a different, like they all have different roles and that was really neat. So like I was comparing it to like the compost is kind of like a water glass because it holds water. I mean, I'm teaching six year olds, so I don't want to go over the whole details, but so definitely how we started off and planting the seeds was really neat. But what I definitely learned is um, pest control management right from the start, even if there's nothing. So get those fruit fly traps in the group stock also. Uh, you don't see it in that picture, but another picture, like there's a yellow, yellow trap in every single, <laughs> okay. but have them add that in there and explain why, uh, talk about, we, I started off and you had said it might not be the best idea. And I said, well, we'll be fine. I, we, I gave the students a choice of like five different seedlings or six, but then it just got a lot, it just got very time consuming to try and write down, they did this, they did that, and then try and manage a certain seedlings. Definitely, I'm going to avoid. So that's why the second time around, I said, you know what? Just three things. They're all growing one radish. They're all growing well, one radish, like planter, one lettuce planter, and one carrot planter. And that you made a video like this is how you planted carrots. So it was nice that I'm not always doing the talking. So keeping an expert. So keeping your videos that you made, if you want to do some fresh ones, 
it will be very happy next year. Okay. But uh, seeing that and keeping it simple for the gardening so it's manageable as the teacher and also manageable for the students Avoid vine growing plants. So sugar snap peas are great, but in a green stock, if there's they're all growing sugar snap peas, it doesn't really work because they grow so tall. Um, so keeping it to short, easy shade loving plants and integrate next year, actually integrate a little work booklet, like a arts and crafts yeah. alongside. So every step along the way, uh, the students have another activity in arts or in math to do alongside saying, okay, we're planting a seed. Okay, let's do a basic basic counting seed activity alongside in our booklet or on the table or just counting seeds. So I, I think it'd be more the gardening itself is from from my point of view is readjust the lights and manage pest control and keep it simple. The, the simplest is the easiest. Absolutely. <clears throat> and, you know, and that's usually the case, even for adults, I find that, that uh, new gardeners want a, a big garden, they want a fancy garden, they want to grow everything that they think they could possibly grow. But it really is best for everybody to start simply. Start small, start simply. And there was a, a book that came out a number of years ago, Everything I Learned, I Learned in Kindergarten. Have, have you read that book? I've, I've heard teachers reference it, but it's like an expression that teachers reference all the time, but I haven't read the book. Is it good? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's still, it's just basic. The idea, you know, is, is in kindergarten, you learn simplicity. You learn the basic skills of how to manage day to day. And that carries forward in life in every other lesson you learn. And I think we sometimes forget that. So what you're teaching to kindergartners is identical to what you could teach to parents who have never gardened before. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think I think it's just a it's a great thing to keep in mind that like school is relevant and what you're teaching and it's not because they're young learners that they can't learn real life skills. So and it goes the same for your kids. Don't underestimate your children. You can teach them a lot. Like yeah, it's not because they can't tie their shoe at seven years old or eight years old because there's velcro out or that you have to give up. They can do it. It just takes time and patience, but they can learn some really complicated skills. Like when you think about it, like kids, not saying it's a good thing, but a long time ago, kids were doing, were working with adults in shops and during the industrial aids, not recommending it at all, but they were doing complicated tasks and they can do it. It's not, it's not because they can open an iPad that they're amazing. They can do, they can blow you out of the ballpark. If you just, give them that controlled environment they can cook at seven years old like kids can play piano when they're five it all goes with you got to trust them and you got to guide them along the way and make Absolutely. it fun big wool dog saying jan would having plants growing during the school year before summer break comes the students could make a dish with all the veggies and herbs to eat so what is your plan uh for the harvest because you you've selected plants that grow relatively quickly and so what is the plan at harvest before the the kids leave at the end of this semester yeah i want this I, i'm gonna have time so starting a garden in like this time of year for my area in montreal because the sunlight is much easier than it is because you're i'm gaining more light every day so it even shows in the classroom it helps and this the school year is a bit longer, but so to answer the question at the end result, I think I was, I'm not sure yet, but I think that question is really well positioned as, I think it'd actually be fun to make a, like we do like a giant classroom, like little salad or whatever, and then they have some, but I also want the students to, but not all the, not, not, I want the parents also to see the results. So I think I'm going to try splitting a bit. Like I want the students to be able to bring like, a little bushel of radishes home. So I'm not sure yet. I think maybe it's going to be a cooking activity with uh, something simpler, like maybe like a little radish activity or take that carrot and make turn it into a carrot pie or something. I'm not sure. I'm sure it can be done. But okay. something fun where they can actually bring harvest home. I want them to go home and say, look, mom, look, grandpa, I did this. And then I want the family to say, let's make a supper with that. Classroom is fun, but I want them to bring that 
I want them to inspire their parents at home. That's my end goal. Like I want the parents to say, oh, this was really cool. And I want the students to repeat what mom and dad are saying, saying this was really cool. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And it's, it's that creativity that, that you have throughout your instruction. So it makes perfect sense that you would have a creative result towards the end to really make it uh, the whole process enjoyable. Yeah. I think that's so fantastic about what you're doing. And so what's the, what's the favorite thing? I, you know, I, I have dozens of stories, but there are a couple stories that I always come back to that are my favorite times from the Galileo Garden. So in, in the short time you've been doing this, would you share with us one or a couple of the favorite things that you remember and are so glad you did this? Yeah, for uh, what's fun about like five and six year olds, because like, that's what I'm doing gardening with, is how they have no filter when it comes to expressions. So when we see a carrot or something grow, we're like, cool, that's pretty neat. And that's all, what we'll say our friends. Are. Um, but with in the classroom, it's, whoa, there is a leaf. And it's like, for me, it's like, it's a leaf. But for them, it's like out of this world. And then wh when I'm saying, look under the leaf, have you seen that the stem is becoming red? And then they look at me with big eyes and they're like, what's happening? So for me, it's the takeaway is not a specific moment. It's how they're excited and enthused everything that's happening in their garden. Whereas it's like, they'll notice it every day, but they're noticing different things. So for me, it's those, it's how, how they've connected to that garden. So the activities have done, it just secures me in saying that they're able to connect that garden because they're excited to see the changes and it's their facial expressions. So nice. facial expressions, that's the most important thing. Nice. That's wonderful. Well, I don't know if you looked at the clock, but we've come to the end of our time. It's been so nice talking with you and sharing the time and learning more about it. And of course, you and I will be in touch more as we move forward. And I'll see what videos I can make for your students going into to the next season. That's always fun because I've been enjoying following along as you are teaching these young minds this wonderful subject of gardening. So thank you so much, Jan, for being here today. Thank you so much. And everyone out there who's been watching, if you can try and get a, a kid in the garden, go for it. And even if it's for an hour, that's a mission accomplished. And even 15 minutes, that's perfect. Just that's all about gardening. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll be in touch. And uh, I appreciate you being on the show, Jen. So long. So uh, I, I want to give a big thank you to all of you who have watched. This is one of those subjects I've talked a lot about. It really is one of my favorite subjects. It, I hold it very near and dear to my heart, partly because I've got granddaughters that I take out into the garden. I worked at the Galileo School Garden with kids and saw how transformative it is in lives of youth. The, the, the concern I have about all this is this is a subject that really isn't that popular on gardening channels and in gardening videos. The video today has fewer people watching than any other video I've done in many, many years. The video that, Dan, that Jan and I did last year has the fewest views of any video I've done in years and years. It's not a popular subject. People just want to know how they can learn to garden and how they can manage what they're growing. And so thank you to all of you who are still here and have followed along. And hopefully, like, like Jan just said, get someone else in the garden. It doesn't have to be a kid. It can be an adult, but get someone else in the garden and teach them what you know. You don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to be an expert gardener. Just teach them what you know and share your gardening experience and you will change their life. And more importantly, I think you change your own life because it is so rewarding when you can share what you're doing with others. So do it. 
as much as you can. Thank you for being here today and following along. And for those of you who have made it this far into today's discussion, I'm not going to be here next week. I'm doing some traveling. I'm going to see my grandkids in Louisiana. We'll talk gardening because I'm going to help my son set up his garden space so that my grandkids there can learn a little bit more about gardening. So this Monday togetherness is important to me every week. And I will miss you not being part of my Monday next week, but it's still going to be gardening related because I get to see my son and his family. And there is that gardening undertone. So I'll be back in two weeks and we'll do this all over again. Thanks for being here. Appreciate your support. Appreciate all you bring to gardening as well. And as always, enjoy gardening.